Welcome to another Atypling Philosopher video on the ATP Geopolitics channel with myself, Jonathan MS Pierce. I have got the internet back. I've got an engineer coming out tomorrow. I can quickly do, I say quickly, you know what I'm like, uh, quickly do uh, a Ukraine War Update Extra video where I give you the juicy nuggets to give you increased understanding uh, and context for this war. Um, Right, where should we start? Well, so much to talk about. Let's talk about uh, Patriot. So I, I mentioned this this morning in my frontline update. Uh, the Ukraine are due to get American uh, Patriot air defense systems, which are you know touted as one of the best in the world. Uh, this is a great article on Yahoo News by uh, Michael Weiss and James Russian. I follow Michael Weiss on tw Twitter. Well worth it. Um, so you know, quite a lot to talk about here. There are two two different versions of the. Uh, Patriot system. The Pac-2 versions of the Patriot are the most capable long-range surface-to-air missiles in the NATO arsenal with a 99-mile range against aircraft and cruise missiles and smaller Pac-3 variants have a far shorter 90-mile range. They are almost entirely designed to intercept ballistic missiles. A combination of both types is typically used to defend American military installations against any possible aerial threat. I believe that these are used to uh, defend the White House, for example. Um, so uh, there you go. Um, Rzeszow Jezionska Airport, a major logistics hub on the Polish Ukraine border, through which a large amount of Western military aid flows to Ukraine, has been defended by two batteries of Patriots of this conf configuration since early March. Um, so the planned supply of Patriots suggests Washington is increasingly nervous about the toll that Russia's repeated strikes on Ukraine's critical civilian infrastructure have been taking on the country's power supply, rolling blackouts and water shortages and uh, are now a constant of daily life for millions of Ukrainians. Uh, basically, there seems to be a pushing the envelope. I was talking about this this morning. Um, I don't think the Western powers are so much worried about escalation because where can you go? other than nuclear missiles. Well, if, if they're pretty confident that Putin's not going to use nuclear missiles, we can start talking about providing these sorts of uh, armaments. Uh, I would suggest main battle tanks are going to be brought in fairly soon. MiG-29s look like they're going to be provided by Slovakia. It's almost like open season. The only thing that people are really still hoping that get introduced to Ukraine from NATO's arsenal things like the ATAC and or other similar long-range offensive missile systems, not surface-to-air missile systems, but ground attack um, surface-to-surface -surface missiles. Um, and the, the fact that you, you, Russia and Iran have been sort of getting closer and closer bedfellows in in their machinations is, is worrying, and I think this is also prompting the West to uh, get, you know, send bigger and better kit over, or certainly better kit. Uh, while it's unclear which variant of the Patriot system will be given to Kyiv, a major question arises, if it's the Pac-2, will it have any form of geo-blocking that could prevent the Ukrainians from targeting f aircraft flying in Russian airspace? For many months, cr Russian cruise missiles have been launched by Russian strategic bombers flying when outside Ukrainian-controlled airspace. Kyiv's current air defense network makes venturing inside Ukrainian territory a potential one-way flight. Ukraine's powerful new air defense tool could threaten the Kremlin's warplanes while they remain soaring over Russian soil. Still, another constant of this war is that what yesterday Washington deemed too risky today it considers necessary. Uh, according to a recent, and I talked about this previously, according to a recent report in the Wall Street Journal, US supplied high mobility artillery rocket systems, HIMARS, had software modifications that would prevent them from firing at coordinates inside Russia, internationally, in Russia's internationally recognized borders, as well as from firing long range munitions that had been officially supplied to Ukraine, such as the MGM 140 Army Tactical Missile System, ATACMS, uh, than had been. Um, so this is the idea that HIMARS have been hobbled so that you couldn't uh, use them to send missiles over the Russian border or use longer range missiles in uh, the uh, systems. Um, a senior official told a NATO member state um, from a NATO member state told Yahoo News that Washington's technical limitations on the high miles was more of a public relations exercise than a severe logistical handicap. It's designed, he says, to signal to the Russians and to a number of wobbly European countries that American strategic weapons aren't going to be used to whack Russia. But of course, you know, the idea is that Ukraine could probably easily overcome that. 
Um, as per the journal, the Biden administration is wary of a third party nation providing Ukraine with ATACMs, something it could, could not do without US consent, given the end user agreement attached to these munitions. Quote, even if the Ukrainians used another multiple launch rocket platform in their, their arsenal to fire the ATACMs, said the official, they still have to get Washington's OK. So disabling HIMARS is redundant. Um, uh, and so, so on and so forth. Really interesting uh, article. You know, goes on to talk about a, a number of things. But this is great, great news, and this will add to the network of air defence systems. Uh, I was talking this morning about how this is now really important. Uh, this is this is very important. However, I think. Countries need to start considering other things than air defense. Air defense is super important and needs to be continually provided. And, and, you know, the missiles need to be continually stocked. However, that's obviously defensive. They need something to help them on the attack. And things like, okay, great. Someone commented on my video earlier because I said, you know, 20 um, leopard, leopard, twos from germany these main battle tanks or a bunch of abrams or whatever which i'm sure they're getting trained on uh, and they'll get given isn't a game changer it will help in particular tactical situations uh, to maybe punch through a line but on, on the whole you know strategic front of the whole campaign those smaller advantages aren't as important as something like long-range missiles that you see how much of a game changer high miles were and they i think they really were they genuinely qualify as a game changer and i think you look at all the damage that's been done to these bases behind the lines by high miles and they have been devastating over the last well since the beginning of their usage but you know just the last few weeks there's been so much destruction that's been caused you start putting another 100 kilometers on that or 60 kilometers 70 kilometers on on that range and suddenly everything's different again you know i think that's that's the kind of thing that ukraine really really need but sticking to Air defense systems, I mentioned this earlier, the SAMT-T, uh, Mamba Air Defense that fire, fires uh, the SB uh, rockets, I think. Um, French-Italian, one is apparently an exceptionally good system, is also being given. Uh, F- France will consider a new batch of air de- defense systems, Consider, uh, sorry, will transfer a new batch of air defense systems to Ukraine in the near future, said French Foreign Minister uh, Catherine Colonna. Uh, earlier, France supplied Ukraine with Crotal air defense systems, and in collaboration with Italy, they supplied the Sant systems. So this is a further system they're looking at providing. We we should see what that is. And then this is just interesting here. Ukraine is getting seven of the nine best NATO air defense systems. Uh, so they're not being given third. I know very little about that. They've been giving Patriot now. They've already got some Naz- uh national Norwegian. Um, it's a, it's a American Norwegian collaboration. Um, Sant uh, France and Italy. They, I haven't got the Sky Saber from the UK. Iris T from Germany, Switzerland, and Italy. Um, Aspeed from uh, Italy. Uh, the Stormer from the UK and Hawk from America. So although that's fairly old, but it has been upgraded a little bit. But um, that's just absolutely fantastic. Really, really good news. Uh, further to that, uh, Czech Republic has delivered 20 152mm um, Dana self-propelled howitzers to Ukraine and later to ship upgraded Dana, M- Dana M2s with a 25.5 kilometer range. Again, really useful. Self-propelled um, guns are exceptionally uh, useful for shoot and scoop purposes. Um, fantastic. And to stick with Czech, the Czech company... Excalibur Army is engaged in the modernization of the T-72 at the expense of the United States and the Netherlands, reported, so as in they're paying for them, uh, reported that one of the African countries, which had previously ordered 30 tanks of this type for itself, decided to abandon them in favor of Ukraine. In other words, you know, they would give up those 30 tanks for Ukraine. Thus, the company can upgrade and deliver 120 tanks and not 90 as originally planned now i don't know what the time frame on these are apparently it takes them quite a long time to upgrade these tanks so that could be an ongoing thing you know just a bunch a month rather than 120 all at once the african country will receive other products in the company of the company in return no one quite knows originally 
rumours were it's Morocco because they've given a bunch of spare parts to Ukraine. But actually, we're not sure that 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 African country is Morocco. So some African country has 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 helped by saying actually Ukraine need those thirty. Uh, so that's fa absolutely fantastic. Okay, so next we have uh, some. If you remember last week, uh, there were, or uh, goodness knows when, at some point recently within the last week, two Russian bases were hit, air, air fields were hit um, within Russia, not within the occupied territories. Uh, and there was speculation as to exactly what hit them. And then it turned out that the claims were it was a, a, an old Soviet. A TU-141 reconnaissance drone uh, that had been converted by Ukraine, launched from a tube, and it has got a range of up to a 1,000 kilometers. I mean, these are old-school pieces of kit. I mean, you wouldn't think to call that a drone anymore. I mean, this looks like, you know, it looks like it's out of the 70s um, because, do you know what? It, it is out of the 70s. Uh, first flight, 1974, um, and then introduced properly in 1979, um so there you go uh it's been used by the armed forces uh, of ukraine since uh, 2014 um but yeah that was used they think and actually here's um the v first visual proof of them being used in uh converted in use in ukraine i mean that's quite loud sorry it's just a big old rocket i guess And there it goes. So, yeah, there it is. It almost certainly was one of those things. I mean, that's what everyone says it was. Uh, this is an interesting comment from uh, Thierry uh, uh, Schmidlin, who's a just a fantastic contributor to the... And uh, do you know what? I have to say, props to... And lots of people have been saying this recently. The comments threads uh, in on my YouTube videos for both ATP Geopolitics and uh, back at uh, A Tippling Philosopher are just brilliant. Like, you guys bring so much just decent conversations, first and foremost, not just bot trolls and bots. There is that. Um, but such a high proportion of, of quality content uh, and a great wealth of expertise and knowledge. I mean, I'm just some random, right, on the internet, that does a bit of research and is trying to communicate stuff to you. But there are so many of you in particular areas that know far, far more and are, are, are willing and able to communicate that in, in really useful ways. So Phil Jamison said, uh, this is when I was talking about the Panzer Howitzer 2000s having to be taken to, or Germany sort of sorting out a repair base in Slovakia uh, to repair the guns. Um, and Phil Jamison said, if I were the, uh, manufacturers of the Panzer Hertz of 2000s and I'll be using the opportunity to repair their guns as a way of looking to improve the reliability and robustness of their weapons. It would be a win-win for all involved. These comments would also apply to all other weapon systems supplied to Ukraine. Thierry says some def defaults have been identified, uh, so some faults have been identified and were cor corrected after first use in war conditions. The problem here is the considerable amount of shells that these systems fire. Any gun has a limit that uh, you know it can fix around uh, 5,000 shells per barrel. Um, some of those systems were reported firing 300 shells per day. So the systems are not designed for such heavy usage. And that is true for every artillery piece. We see more and more videos of those self-destroyed uh, because they were used well over their limits. And when you fire an Excalibur shell to reach a target at 48 kilometer distance, the pressures inside the chamber are colossal. The metal will be used at... Uh, as its limits and fatigue will appear very fast. So that has nothing to do with the quality of the material itself, but with physical limits of any device. You can produce guns with higher limit, but they will be so heavy that they will not fit in the, uh, fit on the subsystem that should allow them to move alone. And that way never reach their limits because they'll be destroyed by counter battery fire long before, um, long before that moment. And he goes on to say, uh, an equipment definitely needs a real war campaign to prove itself. That's true for all weapon systems, for sure. I know that some 
uh, lacks of German Panzer 2000s, Panzer Howitzer 2000s, were known before the war. Remedy was tested but not completed during the first month of the war in Ukraine, uh, where they were used. Um, some other faults or problems were discovered, and at uh, that time, at that time, the company that produces them has done a fine job uh, in very little time uh, to provide perhaps not the um, perhaps not being able to change them to a brand new version, but some pieces have been made more robust, and especially um, have they provided a more accurate manual that indicated what component to check out in detail every X amount of shots. That analysis is also made for older M109 US howitzers and for the M777. I hope it will also occur for the French Caesar, but as France does not talk a lot about that, I don't even imagine that we will hear about that one day. That's really true. Actually, the French are really quite not on, not only on stuff like this, but just on what they're providing. In fact, it's quite rare that we have that kind of admission from the French. They're not very vocal and they've always been like this. It's part of their kind of a doctrine, if you like, is they don't talk a lot about what they give. And that's perhaps why they got maybe trashed at the beginning of the war because they weren't shouting about everything they were giving. So everyone was kind of slagging off France and not doing enough. But actually, that's not how their military kind of generally work, as far as I understand it. Um, so Thierry continues, continuous improvements are applied. But also, uh, um, uh, and that concerns new produced parts for models that were produced before, you'll always have to wait until the armies decide to modernize their equipment to see the newer parts or features applied to the older material still used. For the material that is in storage, it depends on the country's politics. But you have to consider also that too many changes to a material in, induces also a very heavy job of qualifying the people um, to uh, understanding you know, those ma maintenance changes. And in wartime, that's not appreciated by the military. So I, I know T English is not not his first language. So I'm tr just trying to, um, you know, anglicise this even more as I go along. Military people have a, a job to do every day, and they cannot be sent on heavy training all the time to, you know, to to adapt to all the changes that that might be made to these. So the idea is, I and mean, that's really good sort of comments. Thank you so much, Thierry. The idea is that these weren't expected to do this kind of heavy work, uh, and in order to do that. Uh, you need to, uh, it, if if the piece of equipment is going to do that work, you need to be able to react on the battlefield to kind of adapt to that heavy workload and change things up and change pieces and and improve your design as you're going. But obviously, if it's German and and not Ukrainian, that that there's an extra level of complexity and and logistics that are involved in that. And so it's great that that Germany and Slovakia and Poland, where there are these repair facilities and Ukraine that seem to be working in cahoots in order to just improve this Panzer Hatsa 2000 um, as it as it goes forward in the war. I mean, it's it's one of the best, if not the best, you know, self propelled gun in the world. Where to next? Well, this looks pretty darned cool. So this is Sturm S self propelled anti-tank missile complex of the Ukrainian armed forces uh, waiting in ambush mode. So this is like a piece of basically an autonomous piece of kit in a sense, or you know, a censored um, piece of kit. And you really, you know, wouldn't know that was there necessarily as you're driving past. And that that thing appears to be able to stick up, fire a missile uh, and take out uh, a tank. And I, I saw that and I this is, I'm good. Please indulge me, right? I'm going to be a bit of a, a geek here. But it reminded me of <laughs> Aliens when they had the uh, sentry turrets. Uh, this is only in the director's cut, by the way. Um, I'm sad enough to know that. Four of these robot sentries with display and scanners intact. They really kick ass. I think they come in handy. So this service tunnel must be how they're moving back and forth. That's right. It moves from the processing station right into the sub-level here. They mostly come out at night. Mostly. 
come down on that. Okay, come over. Post. Go back. Okay, punch that in right there. And then really what you want to see is them kicking some ass with this. And then they set them up and they fire, all fire off. Oh, RAP, he's no longer alive. They're at the pressure okay. door. How many? Can't tell. Lots. D guns down 50%. C guns right behind it. Stop it. Just an A stop it. 150 rounds on D. Come on. Come on, baby. Come on. 100 rounds. Come on, come on. D guns down to 20. 10. Wait! You're retreating. Uh, and there you go. These auto... <laughs> I, you're indulging me, I know. But actually, this is a really serious point, which is how soon... I mean, I've talked about autonomous warfare uh, before. Mick Ryan's uh, written a lot on this. Uh, the Australian general I often refer to, but how long before we start seeing things like these being um, laid down uh, and used? Uh, how how long do we see like, tracked autonomous drone vehicles, surface vehicles being used? We've already seen drone boats. We've seen a lot of aerial drones. Uh, this is a hotbed of testing this war um for some of this technology and uh, and i wonder these kind of sentry guns or automatic guns you know they've got these sort of things already on you know sea uh, vehicles usvs unmanned sea vehicles they and and um, they the this is well within our technology now we have these things just it'll be interesting to wonder when we will start seeing them actually you know, play a more active role on on front lines in war. Yeah. Anyway, and I just got to show you one of the uh, part of one of one of the greatest action films ever made. Um, but there you go. Uh, <laughs> French President Emmanuel Macron uh, said that a preliminary agreement had been reached on the withdrawal of heavy weapons of the Russian armed forces from the territory of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Negotiations are now underway on specific terms and conditions for the withdrawal. That would be massive if, if that happens. Uh, this has been a bit of a political football, well, actually a tactical and strategic nuclear war, as in war including a nuclear or weaponized nuclear weapon, um, political football. Uh, and it, it's going to be... Uh, really good news that the Russians do pull out, out of there or at least pull their their um, kit away from their military kit away from there. And if, the, if that happens, you know, well done, Emmanuel Macron. He's been kind of lambasted for uh, trying to be too heavy on the diplomacy, uh, trying to phone Putin too much and all that kind of stuff. That will be, a, if, he's, if he's actually causally involved in that, that will be a really big win. Um, good stuff. Uh, and here's uh, a... And yeah, I find this interesting. So the quote um, from the Ukrainians, today we adopted three key European integration laws on the media, a transport procedure for appointing judges of the constitutional court and on national minorities. Okay, uh, look at the fact that Ukraine are involved in a war, right? They've been invaded. And yet here they are politically still trying to put in the check, you know, check those boxes to qualify for for a member of the European Parliament, for a member of the EU, and and to to make strides towards being a better, more um, transparent, functional democracy, this is massively important. These things would be important in peacetime. To be able to actually consider these things in the midst of a war is fantastic, and is testament to how serious these guys are at integrating into um the the very uh, the very you know the organizations that rep represent the very forefront of of democracy in the world 
you know, I know people can be harsh on the EU and, and whatnot, but you know, when you look at the whole world, the EU is probably one of the 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 most important bastions of of democracy there is, um, and that is what Ukraine are aspiring towards. And I think it's phenomenal that they're doing that at this time as well. They are bloody serious about that, and and I think that's fantastic. Uh, last thing I'm going to show you is just a nice little positive thing here. Um, so this is incredible and unbreakable Ukrainian spirit at, at, on display. During a power outage at the concert in Chikasi, the singer Artem uh, Pivovarov sings something based on lyrics from Taras Shevchenko as the audience sings along. Um, so let's listen to this. And this is obviously in uh, a power cut. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Obviously, they they must have had a generator for the sound for the band, but obviously not for the rest of the hall there. But that's fantastic, great, great stuff. And you know, it's great not to be um, constrained in your life entirely by the actions of an oppressive regime, and to to express yourself uh, and your freedom in ways that stick uh, stick the middle finger up at Putin. Um, there you go. Uh, thank you so much for your patience because this is, is this is much later than I, I would have produced this. But that's it, it, Wi-Fi is a funny thing, isn't it? It's a necessity now. It's like it's the air that I breathe. <laughs> Without it, <laughs> I don't function. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have Wi-Fi. I suddenly evaporate. <laughs> anyway, thanks for all your support. Please like, subscribe, share, and um, take care. And I will speak to you tomorrow.